Last week we introduced the book by explaining the key identity in First Peter. Peter calls the people to whom he is writing exiles. An exile is somebody from one place that is temporarily taking up residence in another. An exile, I explained, is not an immigrant. An immigrant wants to, to make their new place of residence their permanent home. An exile is not like that. They, 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 they may have to live in this new place for a while, but their heart still belongs to their home country. An exile is also not a tourist. A tourist just passes through a, a new country with little concern about the people around them. Maybe they have some sense of bemused curiosity, but that's it. Peter says we shouldn't be like tourists either. We are exiles. We temporarily take up residence. We make our dwelling place in this new place that is not our permanent home. We care for it. We invest in it, but we never lose our longing for our true home. If you live as an exile, do you know what that means that you will be in the society you're living in? Different. How can you not be different? You're from a different place. You speak a different native language. You hold a different set of values. If you've been spending time with, with lost people and they cannot tell that you're not from around here, well, honestly, maybe you're not. If someone would describe you and the word different doesn't come out of their mouths, you got a legitimate reason to doubt your salvation. Have you actually been born into this new birth Peter's talking about? All right, let me use these nine verses, verses 13 to 21, to give you the six commands that Peter gives to an exile. Number one is get dressed. Verse 13, therefore, he says, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded. With your minds ready for action, the old King James Version that I first memorized this verse in translated that verse as this, gird up your loins for action which is literally what the verse would say in Greek if you just translated the words directly. Gird up your loins. In other words, get dressed for battle. You ever shown up somewhere dressed totally wrongly? Um, when the last Star Wars came out, my family had one extra ticket, so we invited one of our, our single student leaders to go, to go with us. I told him that the one catch was that we were all dressing up like Star Wars characters, so he should also which of course we weren't dressing up like Star Wars characters. So he showed up at the restaurant in full Star Wars costume and we were all just sitting there in regular clothes. And he, he walks up to the table and he's like, hey, where are your costumes? And we were like, gotcha. Now that's all fun and games, but, but showing up somewhere dressed wrongly could really hurt you if it's in the wrong situation. I mean, imagine if a friend asked you to come over and help him do some construction and you show up thinking he's invited you to a, to, to a dinner party. You got on your loafers and, and a sweater vest and what you really need is there are work boots and jeans. The worst would be, of course, to show up for battle dressed for leisure. Your opponent is suited up with all kinds of gear and weaponry, and your loins are girded about with a towel, and your feet are shod with flip-flops. You wouldn't just feel silly in a moment like that. You'd be putting yourself in mortal danger. Yet this is exactly what many Christians do when it, when it comes to, to spiritual things, Peter says. They just don't take the battle that seriously. They're lazy in their approach to scripture. They rarely pray and, and plead for God's strength in situations that they're, um, they're going through. They don't take temptation seriously and they have no accountability with sin in their life and they, and they flirt with sin often. They treat sin and areas of compromise in their lives lightly. You know, the bad thing with most sin is not the action itself. It's that you give Satan a foothold into your life. By the way, I know that I'm talking to somebody out there right now that, that is entertaining a sin. Right now, you're in compromise. You're looking at porn. You're in a relationship that your godly friends are all worried about. You're starting a relationship that, that's wrong or you're doing something unethical, whatever. I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but you've given a foothold to the devil and he is going to destroy you with it. I am telling you from the Holy Spirit, do not play around. That's what Peter is saying. You need to have your minds girded, your, your, your heart guarded with, with truth. There's a lot of Christian parents that don't take seriously the battle that is going on for their kids' hearts. I, I don't care if your kids are in public school, private school, or homeschool. God holds you, the parent, responsible for the shaping of their hearts. That's never something you give away to somebody else. He's holding us responsible to protect our kids from the lies that the enemy is trying to seduce them with. Peter is going to say in, in chapter 5 that Satan walks about in our society like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Listen, if I knew that there was some kind of predator on the loose in my neighborhood and I let my kids go out completely unsupervised, how would I not be considered a delinquent parent? Listen, a far more dangerous enemy than any sexual predator is hunting your child and mine. And that predator is named Satan, and he is using the winsome lies of the culture to destroy them. Peter says, wake up and get dressed. 
clothe your mind in scripture, bathe your heart in prayer. The second command in the, the second part of that verse, if you look there, is lift your eyes. Set your hope, Peter says, completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is urging us to set our hope exclusively on what God has promised to us as our eternal inheritance. And what is that, do you recall? That we will know Christ, that we will be like Christ, and that one day we get to be with Christ in a place where there's no more crying and no more pain and, and all sad things come untrue. Peter says, set your hope completely on those promises. Don't cut it or water it down with anything. You ask, how do Christians water it down? Well, they set their hope or their happiness on, on other things that God needs to provide for them in order for them to be happy. I, I, I'm glad I know Christ, you might say. I, I'm glad I, I he's making me be like Christ and I'm glad I have the promise to be with him one day, but I also really, really need you to provide me with, with good health, with good kids, great marriage, lots of money, and then when God doesn't come through with one of those things, we accuse God of letting us down. But let me just ask you to consider, what do you feel like God has to provide for you in addition to the promise to know Christ, to be like Christ, and to be with Christ? Um, what is he, else does he have to provide for you in order to fulfill his promise to you? You know, Christians love the verse Romans 8, 28. And we know that God has promised to work all things together for good to them that love God who are called according to his purpose. But you have to ask, what is that purpose? Well, Paul answers the question in the next verse. Paul says, here's God's purpose. Here's the good thing that he's pursuing in all these things. Those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. His purpose is for you to know Christ and to be made like Christ. That is how all these things are working together for good. So yes, pray and ask God to bless you and take care of you now, but, but put your hope your hope exclusively in knowing Christ and being made like Christ and being with Christ. And if in a particular season that is, that's all that he gives you, you can be satisfied with that. Here's command number three, don't look back. Here's what he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. You know, before you came to Christ, your life aspirations arose out of a wrong way of looking at the world. Peter says, calls them the desires of your former ignorance. Wrong desires that grew out of wrong ways of looking at the world. You thought, for example, that making lots of money would make you happy. And then maybe you saw that the people who made the most money didn't seem to be the happiest. Or maybe you thought romance was the key. If you could ever just, just find that, that special person and the love of your life. You know, I saw an interview recently with the hip-hop star Drake where he said one of the most profound things about the human, human soul. Here's what he said. There was a point where I felt like I needed to keep the company of a different woman every night. I was trying to fill a void. But in those moments after sex, I'd know that it wasn't working. Those quiet moments are the realest moments that a man will ever have in his life. The next day, I would convince myself to do it again, but during that time, I always knew it wasn't working. Maybe you thought that being liked by others was the key. Or maybe you thought you'd find this by being the best. You know, like everybody else right now, I'm watching the Michael Jordan documentary, uh, The Last Dance. Here's a guy who is literally the best that there ever was. And it didn't lead him to happiness. It led him to emptiness and to, a, to an unsettledness that you're gonna see come through in these interviews. You assumed maybe that, that life with you in charge was just gonna make you happy, but something woke you up to the fact that it just wasn't true. Or maybe, maybe you just considered the cross. You know, if Jesus Christ is true, then the way of rebellion against God leads only to death. That's what the cross shows you. Real life is, is found only from the resurrection. And, and so when you realize that, you turned your back on your self-willed way of living and you surrendered to Christ. You demonstrated that by being baptized by declaring that you were being buried to your old way of living and, and raised to new life in Christ. But what Peter is recognizing is that even after that profession of faith and even after that realization, that aha moment, even after that conversion and your baptism, it's, it's easy to fall back back into those old ways of thinking. Now you, for example, you sense some unhappiness or you're, you're, you're discontented and, and the first impulse you have is, I just need some more money and then I'll be okay. I just need a different living situation. I need to get vengeance on somebody. And Peter says, remember, you recognize once that that, that doesn't work. Don't go back there. You were, you were buried by baptism into death to those old things. Don't go back there. Those old desires came out of ignorance. Don't assume I just need more money. I just need out of this marriage. I just need to get married. I just need to get even with this person. If you're unhappy, pray.
press into the hope of knowing Christ. That's what the cross and resurrection show you about happiness and purpose, that there you're going to find your purpose of knowing Christ and being made like Christ and being with him one day. Thanks for joining us today here on Summit Life with Pastor J.D. Greer. We'll get back to today's teaching in just a moment. But first, I'm very excited to tell you about our brand new featured resource starting today. And we're officially kicking off the holiday season by offering our Summit Life listening family a set of Christmas cards that reflect the true meaning of the season. There's something undeniably special about receiving a handwritten note, particularly during the festive season like Christmas. In a world dominated by screens and keyboards, it's easy to forget the joy of holding a physical card in your hands. It's a reminder of the warmth and thoughtfulness that goes into every message. And what better way to rekindle that spirit than through Christmas cards? Don't miss out on this set of 20 exquisite holiday cards crafted just for you by giving your gift of $35 or more to this ministry. You can donate today by calling 866-335-5220 or by visiting us online at jdgreer.com. Now let's get back to today's teaching. Once again, here's Pastor J.D. Command number four is be weird. Now, some of you have instinctively been obeying this command from birth, and you don't need any kind of admonition, but I'm talking about a different kind of weird, okay? Verse 15, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all of your conduct. Verse 16, for it is written, be holy because I am holy, quoting from Leviticus 11, holiness. Holiness, that is a strange word for most Americans. And to be totally honest, it's not very attractive to most Americans because the word conjures up images of something sterile and boring, bright, white, colorless light, or maybe sanctimonious, pious, prudish religiosity that's just no fun. But think of holiness as wholeness, W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S, -E -S, which is actually where we get the English word holiness. Holiness is holy, perfect goodness, holy, perfect justice, holy, perfect integrity, holy perfect love now we're all attracted to those things right perfect justice perfect beauty perfect love who wants a government that is partially unjust no girl wants to marry a guy that is only partially truthful or partially faithful or partially loving God is pure goodness and so things like injustice and impurity and deception are repulsive to him Habakkuk 113 says that that God is of such pure eyes that he cannot even behold evil that doesn't mean that evil is is invisible to him it means he can't look on evil with neutral emotion I mean think about watching something that you find repulsive a torture or, or some kind of injustice you see something presented a movie or a documentary on cruelty or abuse or the damages of marital impact fidelity or racial is easily accessible for the poor so the poor can can glean from those sections for themselves and eat now nobody else in the ancient world did that farmers in those days would like most business owners today try to wring out every last cent of profit from their 